Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being so numerous so early in the morning. Um, I just want to give a little introduction before we start really looking at the images, because I think it's quite interesting how I came about uh, doing photography, making documentary films, and indeed writing books, because I always had a probably a desire to travel. Age six, you know how, as parents and parents' friends, you ask the children, what would you like to be when you grow up? And in fact, some friends of my parents said, what would you like to be when you grow up? We lived in London at that point, and I said, a tube train driver. My father looked rather surprised. I come from a privileged background. And he said, why do you want to be a tube train driver? And I said, well, I want to travel. To which he answered, you'll travel from one end of the tunnel to the other. But in fact, age 13, I was inspired by the Belgian cartoon character Tintin. I think probably most of you were, everyone nodding there. Um, and I announced to my parents, age 13, that I was going to Paris for a week. Well, they didn't think much of that. They had my passport. I didn't have a train ticket. But indeed, I left home from Switzerland and spent a, a fun week in Paris. I did let them know that I was all right. But I did get to see a different way of life because I ran out of money pretty quickly. I slept rough. Uh, I did make it home, back on the train. And subsequently, I kept on traveling. So by the time I got to the age of 16, my father was getting worried. He said, you know, you could be arrested uh, for doing this. You know, you're traveling on planes and aeroplanes without tickets. So he gave me an interrail pass <laughs> and $100 for the summer vacation. So I was a bit surprised by this, and I said, well, how am I going to manage on $100? And he looked at me, and he said, if you managed on nothing, you'll do very well on $100. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I wanted to travel was, in fact, because I wanted to become a painter. Um, and uh, indeed, I went to Chelsea School of Art in London, graduated, uh, taught at art schools, exhibited. But in 1982, I applied for a Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Fellowship to fell a tree in Central America and take it through the jungles of Central America. That actually fell through uh, five days before I left. The Churchill Trust very generously said, well, you can come up with another idea. And I wanted to go to Siberia, across Central Asia. But some of you will remember the Korean airliner that was shot down by a Soviet MiGJet fighter. And then I said to the Churchill Trust, how about the road to Mandalay, the golden road to Mandalay? And half the Burmese cabinet were killed in a suicide attempt. So the Churchill Trust were getting a little suspicious when I announced to them that I wanted to follow the ancient trade routes to China. And uh, they said, yeah, that, that would be fine. We've given you the fellowship. Do you have any visas? And I was going to cross uh, eastern Turkey into the Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran, through Afghanistan under the Soviet occupation, into China, across a border that hadn't been crossed since 1949. And my answer was, no, I don't have any visas. But that has never been a barrier. So that seemed all very well for them, but it was a very embarrassing and important point. As I left, I had to turn to them and rather sheepishly announce that I'd actually spent all the fellowship money in the two years that I hadn't been traveling. So uh, with great nervousness, they gave me another 800 pounds, approximately $1,000 in those days. And that's when I set off on this first uh, major journey um, across uh, the Middle East, to China. The first picture, as you can imagine, without visas in the Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran, I was a little nervous to be greeted by this kind of uh, graffiti, clearly uh, a Westerner depicted, impaled on the halo of the Statue of Liberty. And again, I didn't speak the language uh, when I orig originally arrived, or indeed, I couldn't read the script. This is a picture of a mullah, a priest, counseling a woman in a side street. I took this picture very quietly, thinking it was some exhortation to the Iranian Islamic Revolution. And in fact, when I returned home, I had it translated, and it reads, gas and water boiler repairs to the left. <laughs> I then wanted to travel into Afghanistan. In fact, the, the Afghan Mujahideen were the holy warriors, as they were known then, were very nervous, because they said, go like all the journalists to Pakistan. And I said, well, no, actually, I'm not a journalist, and I'm heading for China. Why would I want to go to Pakistan? In fact, I was taken to a safe house. Uh, I was kept for a week in a room. I wasn't allowed to speak loudly. I thought I'd been taken hostage. I'd been kidnapped. Because even if I wanted to go to the toilet, I had to knock on the door. I think the reason for that was that they had to shoo the women away from the courtyard. Uh, two young men came, and they took my bags, a camera bag, small camera bag, and a duffel bag. And they said, you have to come and join us later. Well, that was on the first night. I was expecting them to collect me. Two days later, they returned, and I said, well, where are my bags? And they said, well, actually, the vehicle was ambushed that we were 
traveling into Afghanistan with, but don't worry. I saw someone take the bags off, said one of them, and when you get to the first village in Afghanistan, you just ask for them and you'll get them back. <laughs> you can imagine, a lot of people have heard the stereotypical image of many Afghans. So I was very disappointed. Eventually, I did travel in with two uh, Afghan uh, farmers, and I was devastated because I couldn't document what I was seeing, not hundreds, but thousands of people fleeing towards uh, Iran. And I traveled for some six weeks in Afghanistan, even heading into the center of Herat, the second largest city of Afghanistan. And as you now know, with the war going on today, uh, it's a very difficult conflict. Not all the more so because I can only tell you, I was with one of the major Afghan Mujahideen leaders. And on one evening, we were literally uh, sleeping in a, in a house within almost a stone throw of where uh, resupply helicopters, the enemy, were landing. I was always terrified. I didn't understand what was happening. I then headed towards Pakistan with uh, 60 men looking to have resupplies of weapons. I was, at the end of the day, in a village mosque, and two young men with patoos. It's a kind of blanket that all men in the countryside wear, which is used as a carrier bag, a prayer mat, a towel. So uh, they asked the village mullah, had they seen a foreigner come through the village? He questioned them further, and then he pointed to me in the corner of the mosque where I was about to sleep. And they came towards me, they undid their patus, and inside were my bags. And this is the village where everything was returned to me, some 200 miles, 300 kilometers from where that ambush took place. It was a curious place because often I wasn't allowed to be known as a foreigner. And in fact, in that week, I learned the prayers in Arabic, Bismillah rahman rahim and would pray with them because otherwise people would be suspicious. Where I was allowed to be known as a foreigner, what was remarkable was that everyone tunes in, and certainly did in the mid-80s, this was in 1984, would tune into the BBC Persian service. It's the world service. But the, the, the words, the first words, are in English. And I would go to villages, and people would even introduce me as a man from Inglistan, England. And the village elders would come forward and they would place their hand on their hearts and they would bend down with the words, and our next program will be in Persian. <laughs> I then traveled on, pretty anodyne picture, but the reason I show you this is that there are the 60 men at the top of the mountain. Originally, I didn't understand why they would run down at such breakneck speed. The reason being is they wanted some momentum to carry them up the other side. 10 days like that, and all we had was one of those flat pieces of bread, a, a naan to eat at the end of the day. I gave up wearing a watch, because in fact, what would happen? I would say, you know, how far to the next village? And they would say three hours, and then close to three hours on, I'd see nothing but more of these desolate mountains. And I'd look at my watch, and i think, I should be in the village any moment now. And I would turn to one of the men next to me, and I'd say, how far are we now from the village? And they'd say, three hours. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I travel without visas. I even entered China uh, across the mountains, the Karakoram, without a visa. Uh, no one had crossed there since 1949. I, I was eventually arrested in China. Four days later, the Pakistan military authorities had warned uh, the Chinese that there was a foreigner wandering around. And in fact, this was an area that was uh, populated by Uyghurs. It's the nationality in Western China, Muslim nationality. And I would indeed greet them with assalamu alaikum. I would bend down. A lot of them assumed that I was an overseas Chinese Uyghur. And very diplomatically, I would have to say, look, I'm really sorry. I'm not overseas Chinese. I'm not a Uyghur. Uh, and sometimes I'd have to explain I was not a Muslim. And in one village, a young man came forward and he said, well, how many Uyghurs are there in Inglistan? In those days, I didn't know of any. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, there aren't any. And he turned around to the crowd and he said, he's the only Uyghur living in England. <laughs> well, I was arrested on numerous occasions in China and I realized that they gave me a one month visa, but I realized they were never gonna put me in prison. The alternative was paying a fine, but I had no money and then they wouldn't put me in prison. So I headed for Tibet. And just one little anecdote, uh, here in Tibet, I was told, this, this, this is an image of Zhou, it's a, a cross between a yak and a cow, and I was told that yak backbone, properly crushed and mixed with gold dust, is used as a contraceptive. It was only when I was leaving the village, one of the men came up to me to say, it doesn't always work. <laughs> so I arrived in Beijing on my one-month visa. The Chinese had heard about the journey, and they asked, actually, if a picture could be taken of me um, for the Chinese press. 
And so this was actually the image that was used in the Chinese newspapers. And the caption underneath read, Nick Danziger with the Imam of Beijing, and in parentheses underneath, Nick Danziger is on the right. <laughs> well, I returned to Britain. That was actually my only set of clothes. Um, I had to phone the Churchill Trust from Beijing to say I'd run out of money. By then, they were very happy to pay for my airfare home. In fact, I came, I, I hitched on ships and got back to Southampton. The crew of the ship said, look, you know, you're never going to make it alive to London. I didn't really quite understand, but on a busy commuter train from Southampton to Waterloo Station, there was a lot of room around me. And on my first morning back in London, I was the butt of racial abuse, and I was absolutely devastated. And it sounds trite here, but people, particularly in Afghanistan, had risked their lives to make sure that I could get alive uh, and out of their country. And at this point, I did want to go back to painting, but somehow visiting those peoples in areas from which there was very little news, I suppose, was always there. And then I was commissioned to go to uh, Kurdistan when Saddam Hussein was bombing his own people with chemical gas attacks. And again, witnessing that the vast majority of casualties were civilians led me back to continue this work, heading very quickly after that back to Afghanistan and seeing that in the capital, Kabul, um, many of the men had fled, not wanting to be press ganged into the army or one of the military groups, um, or um, were out fighting. And the children and the women having taken over the running of the economy, you can see a 14-year-old here welding and recycling goods containers, risking life and limb, going into minefields, even when they knew mines are there, just to collect firewood, to be able to sell that, to be able to purchase bread. And the only growth industry in Afghanistan over the last 30 years has been the building of prosthetic limbs. Now, what I forgot to mention to you, on that first journey in Afghanistan, I spent nearly two months, and I didn't meet one single woman in the countryside. Actually, no, I, I should, it's not quite true. I met a grandmother, and she was remorselessly teased because a foreigner had met her and seen her. Usually in a village, you can't just walk in. It would be like us walking into someone's home we don't know. You wait on the outside of the village. So that was another reason I wanted to go back to Afghanistan, was to see how women were living. And this is a, a daily common occurrence over 20 years, just the fight to get some bread from a bakery. And what I discovered was that the women certainly didn't support the Soviet Union's presence, but what they didn't want was a Mujahideen victory. And the condition of women, women who gave birth out of wedlock in Afghanistan were placed in a mental asylum. Women who were destitute without homes would be placed in a mental asylum. And in that mental asylum, I also discovered a group of children, 16 perfectly normal children. You can see two of the sisters here, Frishta and Hadija, aged two and three. And a boy, Satar, with his wheelchair. When the Mujahideen took Kabul in 1992, they stole his wheelchair. And this is the replacement wheelchair from the International Committee of the Red Cross, his orthopedic center. They later took the tires off the wheelchair. Here you have the armed men who were terrorizing the people. This is a taxi, but running a bus route. They hauled the people out of the back of the taxi to commandeer it to take them to the war front. And the total anarchy, you could not cross indeed a city, let alone Afghanistan, without meeting these armed groups. If you were from the wrong nationality, the wrong background, well, your fate was in the hands of one of these often drug-crazed militiamen. You can see the powerlessness of the policemen in the background. So when the Taliban came to power in 1996, they were actually welcomed. The extraordinary thing about this picture is that is, or was, the high street, the main street in Kabul, the capital of the country. Women were told to go home, not allowed to work. Girls were told to leave school, but schools were not to be open to them. I think many of you here would think that that was the Taliban diktats. But in fact, what I would like to stress is it's the way that many Afghan men think. Many people will say, well, that's in the Pashtun culture, but there are Uzbek and Tajik and Turkmen men who will not, even today, 
under areas that are not under control by the Taliban, will not allow their wives or their women, be it children, in other words, daughters or sisters, go to receive medical attention, even if they're dying or in childbirth and having labor problems. They do not want their women folk to be examined by a male practitioner. One of the projects that I am now have embarked on for several years, as many of you will know, the United Nations Millennium, Millennium Development Goals, the eight of them. I won't list them here. But I began this in 2005 as a result of a commission from World Vision, the International Humanitarian Aid Agency. And the idea was to get a feeling of, was there going to be progress with the huge amounts of money being spent to bring people out of extreme poverty? This is the twins, Husseini and Husseina. Their mother was having labor pains and problems. She needed to get to a hospital. The family didn't have the money to pay for the petrol for the ambulance. The husband was away looking for work in Ghana. It took her 72 hours, three days, to get the money to pay for the petrol for the ambulance. She got to the hospital. She gave birth to the first baby. The hospital staff, unaware that there was another one on the way, and as she gave birth to the second child, she died in childbirth. So in 2010, I thought it would be interesting to go back to see how those two children were faring. What I should also say was that in 2005, Niger had one ultrasound machine that would have been impossible for her to get to. Well, I returned in 2010. I was very surprised because in 2005, I didn't expect to do this project. And what did I discover? Very quickly, I found the aunt who'd been looking after them. And I said, how are Husseini and Husseina? They had died of starvation because the aunt couldn't afford milk powder. So as I traveled around the grove, this is Bridget in uh, Zambia, although I don't particularly want to label countries. She wanted to continue at school. Boys are usually favored across the world. She needed one dollar to pay for the textbook, so she decided that if she slept with a man, she would receive that one dollar. And then the mother fell ill, so she continued in the sex trade. And here you see some of those young girls. They are so destitute that they cannot afford the makeup or the clothes. They would go to a woman known as the Queen Bee and receive makeup and clothes, and she would take a commission at the end of the evening. Well, I returned in 2010, that's two years ago, and Bridget is sadly now HIV positive. Had it come as a surprise to her? No. 2005, she had told me that none of the men that she would sleep with, often three or four men a night, three or four evenings a week, not one would accept to wear a condom. What is a powerless 13, 14, 15-year-old able to do. Some do make money. You saw Christabel, the queen bee, in her uh, home before. She now runs two of the most successful bars in the town uh, where many of those young women continue to work in the sex trade to support their families. And in Bridget's case, she had saved up some money so that she could return to school, but she then had a child. The child was taken seriously ill, which wiped out her savings. And she is now, unfortunately, back on the street again. They all want education. And I think many of you are aware of the facts and figures. Many countries are going to meet MDG2, Universal Primary Education. Well, this is one of those countries. Uganda is very proud to be able to say that they will achieve that target. But just look how many are in that classroom. I counted 122 in 2005. And yet the teacher told me that she didn't have enough chalk through the year to be able to write on the blackboard. And as you can see there, many of the children can't afford pens or paper. So in 2010, I returned. I counted 135 children in school. And sometimes we don't give people credit. This is a picture of Ibrahim in Sierra Leone. There was a war reparations program where victims of the war would receive $83. And amazingly, most of the orphans I came across, what did they do? The first thing they did was they went out and bought their school uniform so they could go back to school. Some of them even paid for private tuition. Saturday mornings, many of the schools in Sierra Leone are packed because they want to receive extra tuition. 
This is his home. On the weekends, he works to be able to know that he can put money aside to make sure that he finishes secondary education. Selvi in India, when I met her in 2005, also HIV positive. She died a year later, leaving two orphan children. There's Kosali in the front, the girl who, on the evening that her mother died, she tried to get a rickshaw driver to take her mother to hospital, but she had no money to pay for that rickshaw, and her mother died next to her on the street. Mohan, the husband, did come back into the picture. We've all militated for free ART, antiretroviral treatment. But the problem and the dilemma that Mohan is and has, does he feed himself or his children? He cannot take that treatment because he doesn't have enough money to feed himself on a regular basis. So his dilemma is, does he feed himself to prolong his life to help his children, or does he feed his children? And there's Kosalia today, who, unlike the brother, does attend school. And there are positive stories across the world. This was taken in Bolivia, Estancia Arca, 2005. Six women and children died in childbirth in this very small village of probably 200 families. 2010, sorry, this is still 2005. This is Eugenia, who, uh, unlike her brothers, wasn't going to school because of a two and a half hour walk. She was the llama herder. But interestingly, without any outside assistance, Anselmo, her father, decided to sell half the llamas to buy a little plot of land in Oruru, in Bolivia, to send his children to school so that they would learn Spanish and have numeracy schools. So I returned to Oruru to find the same girl, Eugenia, there on the left in her school uniform. Six of the children, to bear out Hans's figures from yesterday, all in the same room, four of them at school. Now, I've added these pictures because I think it was interesting. Yesterday we heard about the world, the majority world, but we don't have to go too far to find that also there are people living in very difficult situations in Britain. This is actually a rather joyous picture taken in the east end of Glasgow. In fact, I would say this was very entrepreneurial. They have nowhere to play. They break the fire hydrants. They can play in the fountain of water. Three times that day the fire service came to cap that water fountain. And again, the astuteness, it's survival. You know, people living on nothing know how to spend their money. We all talk about the trickle-down effect. I would like to call it the trickle-up effect. The people I meet don't have anything that they can put aside to save. This was taken in Belfast during the Troubles in a Protestant area, and one of the kids came forward and he said to me, well, are you Protestant or Catholic? So obviously, you know, you have to pay a bit of a chameleon. And I said, well, actually, trying to think of a way out of this, I said, I'm, I'm an atheist. And one of the other boys came forward and he said, is that Protestant atheist or Catholic atheist? <laughs> well, it's not just the difficult sides of life, but here I think another telling image. I mean, taken in Edinburgh uh, two years ago, uh, a child, one of 40 on average a day, that doesn't have breakfast. The, the teachers in this particular school not far from the capital of Scotland, needs to be fed by the teachers, otherwise he'll fall asleep in class. Different side of life. I was given access to the former Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair. Just before the war with Iraq was launched, you can see Tony Blair here with the Deputy Prime Minister, sorry, I mean the Director of Communications, Alistair Campbell. And... Um, this access was only meant to be limited for a day or two, and in fact, this is uh, the Prime Minister taking a, a phone call from Yasser Arafat. At the end of the day, I said, could I return tomorrow? They said, didn't you get everything you needed? And I said, what's he doing tomorrow? Launching the Middle East plan. And very fortunately, I spent the next 30 days at very close quarters with some very powerful men. Here, Camp David, I think you'll recognize everyone. Uh, possibly you can't see Colin Powell and Jack Straw in the golf cart. Uh, Tony Blair said to Jack Straw, what are you doing? And he, in referring to Colin Powell, said, he's taking me for a ride, upon which someone said, as usual. <laughs> this is what I call my reservoir dogs picture. <laughs> and a deference to Gordon. This was actually, you might remember, the 
the uh, morning uh, that the shock and awe campaign was la launched, the ministers were all discussing how and when they had learned, actually, that the war had started. And if I remember correctly, Gordon, I think you were gossiping about uh, Scottish politics and football. There are some other moments which I think, uh, for me, were very important. The war had been launched, so what was it like to go and see uh, what policies you had, as it were, started for yourself and here on a Special Forces helicopter flying into the center of Baghdad. Obviously a very privileged moment. Ironically, at the back of the helmet of that uh, particular gunner, Special Forces gunner, it says anyone who approaches within 100 meters will be shot dead. So if you can't read it, it just imagine if you were in Iraq. <laughs> and again, very privileged moment. I asked Buckingham Palace whether I could have access to the audience with Her Majesty the Queen. I was told that you will go in before the Prime Minister, you're to bow once, and uh, say, good morning, ma'am, and I, and I did that. But she said something to me. I was so nervous that I found myself bouncing up and down <laughs> that once became a dozen times. And again, I think one of the ways of being able to get access, this was at a G8. I had no uh, actual access to, as you can imagine, a cocktail party. But for a few moments, I was there standing next to um, President Putin, Angela Merkel, taking a few pictures and then walking away very quietly. I won't repeat conversations because I'm deaf when it comes to this. This is Hamid Karzai, who probably didn't realize that at this point in my life, I did understand Dari. Uh, he has the dubious uh, record of being the president uh, who has had the most assassination attempts against him. And in fact, I inquired about who the man was in the picture on the right-hand side here. And in fact, he explained to me it was a young man who threw himself in front of his president to take the bullets that would have otherwise killed him. And sometimes it's the spiritual leaders, the soul. We do always think about the facts and figures, but I want to get beyond that. What does it mean to be uh, someone who has great empathy for people? And certainly the Dalai Lama matches that. And again, when you have that kind of intimacy, and certainly his charisma, as many of you who have uh, encountered him will know, is quite extraordinary here, as you can see, blowing me a kiss. And I'm not a sports photographer, but I think one of the things yesterday that was mentioned by Jeff was um, values. Values, management skills, and knowledge. And, and the team for me that most embodies that is the most successful professional sports team uh, ever, the All Blacks. And for five weeks as they were preparing for last year's World Cup, I had this extraordinary access. Here, a picture that you might have seen the Haka, but probably never the picture of them in training. And with Perry Weep with a Maori uh, scrum half explaining uh, about the legacy and ancestors, drawing that energy up through the ground. So a very moving moment. And I think, again, when we talk about knowledge and power, uh, probably not very clear to you, but if you look closely, that is one of the All Blacks literally jumping up and down with a dumbbell. So that weight is any one of you being lifted up and down again at breakfast time. They would already be now onto their second breakfast. I mentioned about ancestry and legacy. This is Tiliata. You can see that his ancestors are actually tattooed onto his forearm. But above all, I want to go back to the places that really touched me. This is Mariato, one of the most remarkable people I've ever met, who was mutilated during the horrific war in Sierra Leone. She was held down. She knew what was going to happen, and she pleaded for them to kill her, not to leave her mutilated. And it didn't happen just to the odd young woman. It happened to grandmothers. It happened to babies. If you look closely here, you can see the baby being held in the arms of a woman who is mutilated, but also the baby as well. And this was work commissioned by the International Committee of the Red Cross, where I went to eight different countries to focus uh, on the effects of war on, on women. And 10 years later, last year, I thought it would be very interesting to find those women and to discover what has happened subsequently. It was very difficult to find Marietta. I went back to Freetown, found her grandmother, and she said, I don't know where she is. And she showed me a picture of her in the snow. And one of these pictures was published in a magazine, and I received several phone calls saying that she had moved to Toronto. And two years ago, I found her living in Toronto. She was also illiterate in Sierra Leone, but today she is studying to become a social worker, to return to Sierra Leone to help abused girls and women truly, truly remarkable uh, woman who, with opportunity, will do and 
many things for her own people, cooking me a meal there. I want to end on Afghanistan, a country close to my heart, and you will discover why in a minute. Not a very unusual picture for many of you, but today in Kabul, approximately a dozen women drive vehicles. It is unheard of, basically, today that you would allow your wife or your mother to drive a vehicle. So this is actually a fairly unusual picture. A female MP, and the reason I show you that, you can see she is protected 24-7 by an armed guard. But this is a school, a rural school uh, in Afghanistan. And although it's not this particular picture, I want you to look that in the minus 20 temperatures, they're in open goods containers. There are no glass panes in the windows. And here is one of the girls in a classroom, age 14 to 19. When I asked them, how many of you have mothers who can read and write? Only three raised their hands. I asked them what would they like to be when they grew up, when they graduated. Most said doctors, a few said engineers, one said a journalist, and one girl said, I want to be a member of parliament. So you remember the previous picture of uh, the member of parliament being protected. And I said, but this could be very dangerous. And she said, but I want to help my people. Upon which three girls in that class raised their hands and said they wanted to be president of Afghanistan. And here you have a picture, in fact, of a girl who subsequently won a gold medal in Tajikistan for boxing. And we talked about men in Afghanistan. There are many brave men. This particular man, his daughter, this one, Shabnam, uh, went boxing. He was threatened by his neighbors, not by anonymous people. And when that threat occurred, Shabnam's two sisters decided that they also wanted to do boxing. So this man now has three daughters who are all trying to become boxers. Mabibi, I wanted to show this picture because she was the one at the beginning of the presentation. Out of the 11 women that I tried to refine, Mabibi, 10 years or possibly 11 years old, didn't know her age. Mother had died in childbirth. Father had disappeared. Age 10 or 11, she was looking after her two younger brothers. She was the only woman that I wasn't able to find. The news is that she died five years ago, but she was already married. Had she died in childbirth? I don't know. But I would still want to find out. And finally, do you remember this picture earlier on? Hadija and Frishta? In 1989, they were taken from, from here. I'd set up an orphanage on the outskirts of Kabul. They didn't know how to read and write. And eventually, they were taken to a government orphanage where the girls were placed on the third floor because they didn't want the girls to come into contact with the boys on the first and second floor. They were never allowed outside. Actually, I should correct that. They were allowed onto the roof because there were no toilets on the third floor. The toilets for the girls were on the third floor. These girls slept in beds two or three, sometimes four, to a single bed. Eventually, two and a half years later, I was able to get them out and with a foster mother, a British friend of mine in the background, and Satar, who you saw in the wheelchair. In 1996, when the Taliban took power, I decided that the girls in particular uh, would have no future in Afghanistan. And I decided to adopt all three children. Uh, single parent at the time, I wasn't able to come back to Britain because Britain at that point didn't accept uh, the idea that you could be a single parent uh, for adopted children. But I did eventually, uh, I was able, I was offered visas from various countries, uh, and as a result of that, was able to bring them to the UK to visit my parents. You can see them here in 1997. Uh, Frishta, when she left Afghanistan, had attended school for maybe six months, age 10, could basically do basic additions and no more. Hadija was severely beaten, so she learned nothing, and dreamt of riding a bicycle. That was her dream. Frishta wanted to become a nurse. And Satar didn't even know what a classroom looked like. Well, eventually, six years later, I got married. Here you can see Hadija and Frishta. And May, one of my three children, goes slightly against Hans's idea of the family with two kids. <laughs> because as you will now see, uh, Satar, who is back in Kabul, as I mentioned, age 13, he didn't know how to read or write. He now speaks English and French, reads and writes them fluently, worked for a Canadian construction company. And in the last two months, he started his own a construction company. And to end on the very final picture, well, there's no longer the two, two people family. There are six children in our family and my wife. 
Without her, it wouldn't be possible to do this type of work. Um, we met in Colombia, but that's another story. And I also have a grandchild, so I'm not sure where that graph is going to go in the Danziger family, the grandchild on the bottom left-hand corner. Well, there we are. I really wanted to show you that because uh, my children, through opportunity, which would be the case for all children across the world, can achieve extraordinary things. One son who's become a businessman who didn't know what a school looked like age 13. Frischta is now a nurse. Uh, in Monaco, where we live, in the government apartment, I hasten to add. And Hadija, who dreamed of riding a bicycle, has won a gold medal in the Special Olympics. So there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you.